If you see me walking down the street and I start to cry each time we meet, walk on by. You hear her voice, you don't even question. You don't say, who is that? She would make you feel every single lyric that she sang. And the sound in her voice that expressed hope, sunshiny kind of sound. She had a different sound, but a very sensitive sound, a very small sound. The way she used her voice, her microphone technique, um, her breathing, everything about her was spectacular. She has a haunting voice gets to you. It stays there forever. She stood out as a magnificent ballad singer with that very, very unusual voice of hers. She didn't fit any category. There's nobody, not one person. You could probably ask the world over, who sounds like Dionne Warwick? Dionne Warwick is the only one that sounds like her. And yet, the, I am a combination of my entire family, of course. Marie Dion Warwick was born on December 12, 1940, in a middle-class suburb of Newark, New Jersey, East Orange. The oldest of three children, Dion was part of a gospel dynasty. Her father, Mansell, promoted gospel records, and her mother, Lee, managed the Drinkard Singers, a group comprised of Dion's aunts and uncles. My dad was uh, probably my best friend. He was a pillar of strength, as is my mom. My grandfather was a minister, and my mother's family sang gospel, and her father was a deacon of the church. And we were there from sun up to sundown. Our street was virtually the United Nations. We had every nationality every color, every creed, every religious background. She's a Sagittarian, as you know, and it seems that they're very, <laughs> they're very strong. And like I said, she started dancing very early. She took like a ballet. She started to play the piano and whatnot, and she excelled in that also. What she was determined to do, she did. And she would succeed after what she went after. At 14, Dion and her sister Delia formed their own group, the Gospel Airs. They sang at churches and won first prize at an amateur gospel hour hosted at Harlem's Apollo Theater. The Apollo was a, a very important part of, of our careers, and the great thing about the Apollo, if you could work it there, you could work it anywhere. The Gospel Airs got their professional break while watching the Drinkard Singers perform. This man came frantically running in the backstage area. He needed singers to do a background session. They were recording Sam the Man Taylor and Nappy Brown, and they wanted the drinker singers to back them up. And they couldn't go because they were performing at the Apollo. And, oh, big mouth here, we can do it. And we being my, my gospel group. And he said, OK. The background voices have never been able to be duplicated. I've tried for years to duplicate him with other background singers and things, but the magic has always been those original recordings because they just had the soul, they had the true feeling. After school, get our homework done and get on the 118, the bus, and go from Newark Terminal to the Port of Authority in New York, catch a cab to wherever the session was, do our session, and head on back to Jersey. In 1959, Dion received a scholarship to study music at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. While attending school, she continued recording backgrounds with the gospel airs. During one session, the 21-year-old met a songwriter best known as conductor and arranger for the legendary Marlena Dietrich. His name was Bert Bacharach. During rehearsal, he um, approached me, God only knows why, I must have been singing too loud or something, and he uh, asked if I would be interested in doing more background work and demonstration records of songs that he was getting ready to write with a new songwriting partner named Harold David. One day she came up and she spoke to Bert about uh, doing some demo records. She came in with uh, 
blue jeans, a kind of torn at the knee, a and a little scruffy, but she had that fantastic face with the great cheekbones. You know, she was just delicious to look at. She looked like a star when you saw her with a group of four of them like that. Dion looked like she had the goods. Dion recorded demo versions of the writing team's songs, which were then pitched to the record labels. So we took that demo, and it's Love That Really Counts, and a couple of others we had done to Florence Greenberg. She was a woman in the 50s that started a record company with three young black artists, you know, that she saw at her daughter's high school. She was a definite pioneer. She owned Scepter Records. Florence was the mother of that company. Every artist on the label were her children. In 1962, Florence signed Dion, then Bacharach and David. They would compose the majority of her songs and produce her albums, while also supplying songs for other Scepter artists. The first record we made, for, we, wrote, we wrote specially for Dion. R&B and pop stations played the single. Scepter released Dion's first album filled with many of her original Bacharach and David demos and misspelled her last name. After three years of college, Dion Warwick left school to make time for her burgeoning career. I think the marriage was incredible with the three of them because she gave it that little thing, you know, she gave it that thing, that, you know, where they would say that soul thing, but not just that, it had, you know, that sexy thing that happened with it. Hello, she can go that high and she can sing that low. She's that flexible, she can sing that strong and that loud and be so delicate and soft too. You could see what she could do. The former backup singer became a star after only her first single. She headlined at the Apollo and appeared on local and national dance shows along with other popular acts. As a personal favor to her former conductor, Marlena Dietrich introduced Dion in her international concert debut. Everyone who ever loved could look at me and know that I love you. Anyone who ever dreamed could look at me and know I dream of Oh, great taste. All oh, the gowns that she would wear. Oh, man. And then she had the legs of life. I went to see Ella Fitzgerald. I went to see Sarah Vaughan. I went to see Sammy Davis Jr. at the Copacabana. I went to see Frank Sinatra. I mean, these were my teachers. These were the people that were doing what I wanted to do. Marlena did give me work ethics. Uh, when you get out there, you better do the very best you can. And I never forgot that, ever. Knowing I love you so. Anyone who had a home that would take me in his arms and love me to you. I don't know if she still does this, but she would stand and sing hit after hit after hit, not talk between and she mesmerized the audience. You know, I don't care who's been on it before me or who's gonna come on it after. While I'm there, it's all mine. People have said our musical relationship is like a perfect marriage. Maybe it's built on love and understanding, her love of music, and our understanding of her great talent. Ladies and gentlemen, Dionne Warwick. In 1964, less than two years after releasing Don't Make Me Over, Dionne Warwick had become America's top-selling female artist. We started out with a hit immediately, which is not easy to do, but it happened. And then we went from hit to hit to hit to hit. When you go through the day And the things that people say Say to make you feel so small I mean, we did 
definitely carved our own niche out in the pop, R&B, whatever world. It did not fit into any slot. It was so different than anything that was being done by anybody, groups, girl singers, boy singers, it didn't really matter. In those days, um, you had a lot of great songwriting teams. You had Lieber and Stoller to start with, you had Goffin and King, and then along came Backrack and David. And they wrote, they weren't rock and roll songs. They were songs that were standings. I could always hear Dion in my ear. I'm sure Bert could always hear her in his fingers at the, the piano. Even if Dion didn't do it, we heard Dion doing it right from the beginning. suited their songs tremendously because they were not easy songs to sing. You try and sing a Bacharach David song, um, just timing-wise, tempo-wise, key-wise, the range of the song, uh, they're very difficult songs to sing well. So let me hide the tears and the sadness you gave me when you said goodbye. And Bert would take 60 takes if it took that. Everybody said, now wait a minute. He says, come on, come on, one more time, one more time, just one more, <laughs> and we do it. There are no five, four <laughs> bars, and there are no seven, eight bars. And leave it to you. Two octaves? Would you believe two octaves? I don't believe you. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try it a little from the top? Walk on by. Really? How does okay. that feel? Do you Sounds groovy. I love it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we haven't even gotten through it. No, it's going to be groove. So let me hide. She took it to another level which crossed her over into the pop field, which made it great for people like myself and other black artists, because she gave us that other step to go on. I went to the Apollo and decided I was gonna sing People. Bobby Shiffman, who had taken over, said, you can't sing People up here. They won't understand what you're talking about. This is not the audience for People. I said, you crazy. And not only did I sing People, but I got a standing ovation. And when I walked off stage and looked at him, he was as red as the blouse you have on. Basically, I was known then as the little girl who brought downtown uptown. Well, they didn't expect that of it. That's what made it so phenomenal, you know? For somebody to come out and, and, and sing those kind of songs. That had only been white people. I hear the music coming. People have even said to me, girl, you must have lived a hard life, <laughs> you know, at a very early age. And no, uh, I'm just singing the words because I was too young to know about all this unrequited love stuff. Her versions were always better than the cover versions, so the British people took her to their hearts. She could sing live, and she was brilliant. All these, I mean, we all copied these people. We all tried to copy these great American black acts. The Beatles, the Stones, the bl all the blues players, you know, we all revered them. <laughs> At 25, Scepter Records' top artist blurred the line between R&B and pop, becoming the first black female to record a dozen consecutive top 100 singles. I mean, nobody worked like Dion. 42, 46 weeks a year. But that's what Dion has always thought of it as. This is my job. This is what I do. And then she went to college while she was on the road and uh, she did very well. And I was very, very surprised and proud of her. She was content reading the book, uh, knitting or doing her needle points, but she became excellent at it. She comes from a good family, religious family. Mother traveled on the road with her. Never seen Dion out of line.
never known Dion to be on drugs. While on the road, Dion met and soon married jazz drummer and aspiring actor Bill Elliott. I just thought he was the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life, you know. And uh, said, him, I'm going to have. Within a year, the couple was divorced, but the relationship didn't end. I wasn't ready, really. I just figured that, well, it's, it's fashionable. You're supposed to be a married lady, get married. And so I did. And <laughs> found myself not really happy with the situation. I couldn't do my thing like I usually did. And it was just a case I can't do with and can't do without. That's why I married him again. <laughs> well, here I go again. She seemed to know what I was trying to say maybe better than I was, than I knew myself. She knew how to interpret a lyric. The trio also spent time working on individual projects. In 1969, Dion co-starred in her first film, while Bacharach and David continued to write for films and Broadway musicals. Though not originally written for her, Dion's later recordings of their show material became hits. stuff got a little more theatrical and a little, a little more pop sounding. At exactly the same time that Aretha was coming on like gangbusters with some of the, you know, greatest R&B music that's ever been made. So Dion was getting a little bit of a rap from radio that her stuff was getting too white. In an era of political and social unrest, some young people found the music of Warwick, Bacharach, and David irrelevant. Well, how black do you have to get is what I'd like to know. You know what I'm saying? What is black enough? If, if we wrote R&B to write R&B or pop to write pop, that, that wasn't the way we did it. We, we were always trying to write the best song we knew how. And what I do best is sing. And it doesn't matter what it is, I sing. I'll Never Fall In Love Again earned Dion her second Grammy. By the end of the decade, the trio had sold over 12 million singles and albums. And capacity crowds around the world eagerly awaited Dion's 30-minute medley of her hits. Don't you know that? In the early 1970s, Dionne Warwick maintained a hectic travel schedule performing her hits from the last decade for audiences around the world. Whether on the road or at home, Dion was always with family. Well, that was a period also that a lot of us were uh, seeking spiritual advice, guidance, and so psychics were popular then. It was no surprise to me when she got into astrology because she's always been curious about that. And she got very close with Linda Goodman and then Linda Tola added E at the end of Warwick. 
whatever. <laughs> yeah, that was at a time when I had nothing else to do with my life but to play with astrology and numerology. So I just put an E on the end of my name for vibratory reasons, as it was explained to me. And as it turned out, it was the worst thing I could have done, so I took it off. <laughs> Dion would later say her second name change brought her more bad luck than good. Her collaborators did spend less time than ever in the studio, and her next albums contained no big hits. Then, after a decade with Florence Greenberg and the Scepter family, the trio moved to a larger label in California. But their 1972 Warner Brothers debut failed to make an impact. Before work on her second album began, Bacharach and David took on yet another film project. I think it was our first real flop, and I think that had a lot to do with it. It was very disheartening, and, and suddenly we weren't, uh, we weren't writing together. We just got caught in a real bad situation. I take responsibility for igniting it, because if Hal and I couldn't write, then we couldn't write for Dion. We couldn't write for Dion. We couldn't go in the studio and produce Dion. And Dion was not getting produced. I read it in the paper, like everybody else did, that they were splitting. And I felt betrayed. I felt um, something wrong with this picture. Mo Oster put it to me succinctly. Well, either you go talk to them and talk them into going in the studio, or I have to sue you. Excuse me? You got to sue me. Warner Brothers is going to sue Dion? I don't think so. Though the lawsuit was settled out of court, Warwick, Bacharach, and David would not speak for years. Dion worked with many producers at Warner Brothers and released five albums, all failures. Her only commercial success was a duet produced by Tom Bell after her 1974 summer tour with the Spinners. The song became Dion's first number one record. Ever since I met you, it seems I can't forget you. The thought of you keeps running through the back of my mind. Dion is a private person. She doesn't talk about people, and she doesn't allow you to talk about people. So. When uh, the divorce came about, you know, the, those of us that were very close were shocked. Shortly after the birth of their second son, Dion and Bill divorced for the second time. I was the breadwinner. And the male ego is a very fragile thing, it really is. It was still quite something for a man named Elliot to be called Warwick. After the divorce, she raised those boys. She raised them well, and they adore her, and she was always firm. She didn't take any mess, you know. And wherever she was, if anything happened to us, or if we even acted like something was wrong, she'd come home, catch a red eye home, give us a whipping, get back on a <laughs> three o'clock flight and be back for a show. Oh, yeah. Ignored by radio stations in the late 1970s, Dion found new ways to showcase her hits, teaming up with R&B artist Isaac Hayes on a world tour. I mean, she just took to it because having those gospel roots you know, she, she had it. It was She always had it. So she could just make the transition with ease. Mansell and Lee Warwick often accompanied their 38-year-old daughter on the road. But on June 16, 1977, home in New Jersey between concert dates, Mansell Warwick had a massive heart attack and died. The next day, Dion's mother suffered a stroke. Everybody calls Dion. Dion's everybody's big sister, you know. For the first time, she was the one that, that needed to be surrounded with love from friends, and so is Tuff. I said, relax. You, you're carrying too much on your shoulders. Let some of this stuff go. She got very emotional. And uh, all the pressures and so forth and the stress. But she started to loosen up and have fun. I know she's faced a lot of things. 
out there on the road since I went, you know, with her. But she's come through it. Smell like a rose, you know. Though Dion still performed, she had not recorded in years. Clive Davis, a friend of former mentor Florence Greenberg, approached her about signing with his new record company. And I'll never forget it. It's just, you may be ready to give the businesses up, but the business is not ready to give you up. In 1978, Dion Warwick joined Clive Davis at Arista Records, hoping she would once again experience the family atmosphere she had enjoyed on her first label. Davis promised her his undivided attention. I just knew that I needed a great voice because I was getting these songs in, and so I said, I gotta look around. I mean, I've gotta find a female artist who is unique, a writer's dream come true, who could bring out meaning in a song that even the writer didn't know was there. It was wonderful for her. It was like, you know, like giving someone good medicine, you know? Because she was feeling like, has the business forgotten Dion? Davis wanted his top male artist to produce Dion's first album. I remember, you know, rolling up my sleeves and saying, well, if I'm going to do this, let's see what could I do? What could I do possibly that would, that would compete or compare with her fantastic catalog of music? I was once again right on the money hearing Dion's voice with a pop ballad, a big, crashing, passionate ballad. After a decade filled with personal and professional upsets, Dion had come through what she called a test from God. She became the first female artist to win Grammys for Best Pop and Best R&B Performances in the same year. A million seller, the album Dion remained on the charts for a year. That was my absolute year. There was nothing I could do that was wrong. Everything I did was right. Dion enjoyed her newfound exposure. Between concert dates, she hosted the premiere season of a musical variety series. Solid gold. Dion's duets and collaborations at Arista kept her on the charts. Then in 1983, after a decade-long estrangement, she was offered a chance to work with Burt Bacharach. Burt uh, wrote a song uh, for a TV show with Carol Bear Sager, his, his wife at the time. And uh, he called me. Hello, hello. Dion, yeah, who is this? <laughs> it's Burt, Burt who? <laughs> <laughs> but it was sweet, and boy, she sang, and she just, you know, kind of brought tears to my eyes. She just kind of, she's a very fast learner. Dion's very musical. Dion, Bert, and Carol teamed up to make an album. One evening after rehearsals, Dion heard a Bacharach and Sager song on television. She wanted to record it. It was like one of those four o'clock insomniac moments where you wake up at the end of the film and then all of a sudden you hear this song and Rod Stewart singing, that's what friends are for. To support the message of the song, she wanted to record with friends and give the profits to a foundation researching a disease. We were all devastated by this strange disease that all of a sudden we were, what is this, you know? And we all had a lot of friends and that we lost because of it. She's always been outspoken, but she certainly was, for me, the first music person to actually do something positive about the AIDS um, epidemic. For good times and bad times, I'll be on your side forevermore. That's what friends are for. The song became an anthem in the fight against AIDS and stayed at number one for a month. In 1987, it earned a Grammy for Song of the Year and a fifth trophy for Dion for Best Pop Vocal by a Duo or Group. And the royalties from that incredible record, both the contribution of the record company and the 
copyright owners and the artists supported Amphar about 85% of its first two years of existence. Dion's power gives her persistence, you know. She dedicates her time to any cause that she feels that she can help. And she does it sick, well, tired, beat, anything. Dion created the Warwick Foundation to raise awareness and money for AIDS education. She was asked by President Reagan to serve as a U.S. Ambassador of Health, a position she kept through the Bush administration. AIDS is a mankind killer and it does not discriminate. It kills irrespective of color or condition, age or gender. It is the most serious health threat that we face today. What Dion did was she looked at what was happening nationally and then she said, wait a minute, as well, there, you know, there are people that, you know, that you're not talking about. In Washington this weekend, the stars came out for an AIDS benefit organized by Dion Warwick. The event was expected to raise $1 million for AIDS education. The press criticized Dion and her foundation, claiming that after entertainment expenses, little money reached service providers. Whenever you do anything like that and it becomes really big, you become a target. Dion's never been worried about taking her lumps. She takes them and keeps going forward. The incidents that occurred because of my fundraising efforts, I'm not a fundraiser, I'm a singer. But I feel if I can pull together people to kind of bring awareness, if nothing else, then I'm gonna do it. All of those things hurt after you tried to do all of the things that you, you know, that you try to do to help as many people. And it's evident it stands, it, you know, stands, it speaks for itself, where her heart is. Though Dionne Warwick's image had taken a beating from the press, she continued to perform her classics to sell out crowds. People who have supported this incredible career that I've had thus far deserve as much of me as I can give them. I personally feel that I also deserve as much of me as I can give me. And that part of me is nobody's business but mine. This is a true story. I leaned over to her and I said, you know, I made, more lo I made love to more women, to your music. <laughs> I just have to thank you. Uh -huh. Because between her and Johnny Mathis, uh -huh. you get a girl in an apartment in New York City <laughs> That's with true. that music, was great mood music. That's true. Since her second divorce from Bill Elliott, Dion had kept her personal life even more private. In 1990, her 12-year relationship with actor and Las Vegas club owner Gianni Russo ended. Yeah, we grew up kind of around the guy. You I declined to comment on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really know what their whole thing was, but I, we did grow up with Gianni being around the house. And... After a long absence, she returned to the studio to record an album of new material. She looked to her former collaborators for help. Neither the song nor the album, which featured a duet with cousin and Arista label mate Whitney Houston, made an impact on the pop charts. And Dion, for me, has never been about having pop hits. She's about being a truly great, lasting artist that will be as good when she's 80 as she was when she was 20. It's tough in today's radio world to compete in the hit singles business so that it takes your attention elsewhere. Always fascinated by astrology and psychic phenomena, Dion signed on to host a new half-hour infomercial. Yes, it did confuse a lot of people, but truly, believe me when I tell you, she is not a psychic. And I don't think it was any flaw in her character as far as um, her beliefs are concerned. She was supporting uh, something that paid her money. Let's get right down to the nitty gritty, okay? So people can change their people destiny? People can change their future and change their, their destinies through prayer and positive thinking. I know that uh, Dion's a firm believer in the power of prayer. Now, what, about, what about Dion? What about... Uh, well, Dion doesn't even know this. Because 
about a month ago, I said it'd be two years before I saw a man in her life, and she's not talked to me since then. <laughs> how do you, I asked, I said, well, dang, Ma, you know, how are you gonna, like, handle this? I mean, people are starting to really come with the jokes, and, and it ain't funny, you know, they're coming with all of that about you being a psychic. I said, I'm not a psychic. I am the host of this show. Don't you see me every day that you see this information play? Saying, here she is, psychic of our show, Linda Georgian. Don't you see that? Or don't you want to see it? Allegations of fraud followed by lawsuits and government intervention kept the network and Dion in the news. She quit when the network filed for bankruptcy protection. And we'd walk through airports and, oh, that's the psychic lady, not the singer anymore. And that's when she said, oh, no, this isn't, uh, I didn't work this hard to become a psychic lady, you know. We're messengers. That's all we are, messengers. We bring you the messages for you to react. Say that. If he's going to bring me a message that I don't want to hear, I'm going to tell him, I don't like that. Right. No, that's got to stop. Right. It's got to go. Talk loud. And we collectively can make that difference. This is our responsibility. It's not my responsibility, it's our, our responsibility. In the mid-1990s, Dion participated in congressional hearings on controversial music lyrics. I called Dave Lightweight freaking out, like, oh my God, you know, he's like, hey, that's mine, talk to her. Not all rap music, because some of it is absolute poetry. It does give you, you know, what is happening in the neighborhood, but not keep you there. And that's what Gangsta Rap was doing. She said, Damon, I got an idea. Do you think that the hip hop community will embrace me? And I said, no, I don't really think so. So she said, well, what can we do? I said, well, let's try and do a song, you know. I think anytime an artist steps out to say, look, that's not right, or we need to do more to, more to make this situation better, or whatever, you're going to get attacks, you're going to get all the different things that happen. Lord, we don't need another medal. When those guys came and got out of their limos, they had such attitude. Most of them were like, man, I don't even know why I'm getting on this record with Dion. Man, she's a hater. And when they met her, they all started calling her mom. Mm -hmm. She sat everybody down and said, let me tell you something. I've done everything that y'all think you can do and got away with it. I think that Dion gets all of her soul from the gut. Even though what comes out of her mouth sounds so effortless, I think that she's happiest when she can dig deep inside and I think she goes right back to the church. I earned every single thing that I have. And I've lost things, but it was all because of me. So I, I, I don't blame anybody but Dion. She's the one that has to stand in that space and has to produce whatever it is that has to be produced. But I 